Hey folks, welcome to the podcast. Today I had the amazing Mel Crate from We Are Luminate come back in and we had a really cool conversation about the recent plus size Nike mannequin that they put next to their super thin ones in the Oxford Street store in London in the UK. Um, so many things to speak about around that and social media was, was going crazy around that time as well. And Cancer Research in the UK have recently done um, an advertising campaign on obesity and again caused a bit of an upstir. So uh, me and Mel spoke about the issues uh, surrounding those two things and really great conversation. Hope you enjoy it. Hey, it's Lewis. Welcome to the podcast. Enjoy our conversations anytime, anywhere. Cool, and we're live. Mel, thank you very much. Come back again. Thank you for having me again. It's a pleasure. No problem, no problem. How's it all been going? It's been going good, very good. Busy, but in a good way. So good. yeah, all very interesting, exciting stuff. Awesome. We discussed it a few weeks ago, the Nike uh, mannequin. Yeah. And like social media went crazy. and It did, yeah. It got... I felt the conversation also diverted to all these different things, yeah. pro fat shaming and all of these things. So let's, let's mm-hmm. talk about all of that. But for those that don't know... Um, Nike in their store in London, um, they have a they have a, a plus size range which they mm-hmm. introduced in 2017, and then they put a plus size mannequin in mm-hmm. their store next to like the traditional thin body mm-hmm. type for females that they do, and it caused a little bit of an of an, up, an outcry. Yes, it did indeed. So, where what do you think about that? Yeah, well, it was very interesting when it happened. I think the reaction to it was was extremely interesting and wasn't necessarily what I would have predicted it would be but there was a lot of journalists or fitness bloggers or fitness or health experts coming out to criticize that move of putting a plus size mannequin there of saying it's encouraging obesity um, it makes people feel like it's okay to be that size and um, that actually that size is unhealthy and and we shouldn't promote it as something to kind of aspire to or something to even accept in our society um which i personally think that's a very damaging view i think it's hugely unhelpful on a number of levels but firstly in that you know we're trying to work towards a society that is more inclusive so that includes inclusivity of everybody you know not one demographic and i feel like those attitudes are really unhelpful and very uninclusive and particularly I think the fitness world or the exercise world can be seen as very elitist you know if you if you don't have the right leggings and the right gear and you can't run up a treadmill you know at 20 kilometers an hour then you're not included in this world and actually it's not for you which is not what we want because we want people to be moving more whatever that movement looks like for them true true. the 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 end goal is to get people moving their bodies more which is what we were designed to do yeah so when you're telling people actually we're not making workout gear for you or we're making it but we're not going to display it openly in the store because that's not really what we want people to look like or that's not what we think fitness looks like it feels to them that you know we're not part of that elitist world and I think it puts people off exercise even more. It's interesting, yeah. Because when I when I when I first saw it, and I was speaking to some friends about it, all those different points came up. But if you just boil it down, it's just a really good marketing. Yes, act, absolutely. Right? And lots of people have commented on that as well. Yeah, because yeah. really it was just marketing. And so yeah. I think it was size fourteen. It was bigger than that. I think was it, it was. It was supposedly a sixteen to eighteen. Oh, okay. Which Fine. is, I think, what people is had that the average. With. Isn't it like 14 or something? Yeah, female in the UK? I think it's between a 14 and a 16. Okay. But I think plus size traditionally, or in the last couple of decades, has more been like really. Uh, no, much, much slimmer than that. Really? So a plus size model is somebody that could be a size 10 or 12, but really? that's considered plus size in the modeling world. Right, right. Because right. most models have been, you know, a 6 or an 8 or even smaller at times. Yeah. yeah. So actually. I think the problem that a lot of people had was, well, if you put a size, a mannequin that was a size 14, we'd be okay with that. But as this one's verging on a size 18, actually that's too big for what we consider is acceptable within the plus size world. But they obviously thought that there was a, there are a lot of women who want to buy clothes at that size. Mm, and there therefore, you know, when you see this mannequin, you're like, oh, cool, I want to be like her and I, I can wear these clothes and stuff. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, the, the way people have, lashed out at it I think is quite a simplistic view as well people come in all shapes and sizes as we know and actually it's just giving them fitness gear to wear that feels accessible to them and that they can see on a mannequin I don't think it encourages 
obesity any more than saying you know having a an lgbt plus lgbtq plus group within a workplace encourages homosexuality you know it's actually just saying we're including that you know people do wear that dress size and we sell those clothes so why not put it on a mannequin for people to see yeah but social media it just brings out the worst in people it does and you have these extreme because really you have quite extreme views on either side yeah of course and so you'll always get that yeah 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 yeah. and the people that are kind of like fat shaming let's Mm. say in inverted commas um, I mean their views seem to be you know we shouldn't encourage people to look like this yeah I mean and we should not encourage- well I'll ask you this question you know if you walked into a shop and saw a mannequin that was a, you know a, an equivalent of a male size 18 would that make you go around the corner and buy a cake and eat it in one sitting do you know it would probably make you know probably make go to the gym and work harder <laughs> you know it doesn't it doesn't work that way I don't think I think no, this no, view no. that if yeah, we yeah, yeah. say it's okay to be that size then everybody's going to go out and put on more weight it, I just don't think it works like that I think for, I think for Nike they need to be representative of, of the country or whoever their Absolutely. customers are. Yeah, which, you and know, we say that, exercises yeah. for everyone, but unless we demonstrate that by providing clothing for everybody and, you know, clothing that people want to wear as well. Not all plus-size women want to shop in specialist shops. They want night gear. They want, yeah, yeah. you know, the gear that everybody else is wearing and why not? No, that's true. That's true. Mm. Interesting. And so what do you think, like, healthy is then? Because then, because then that question, the because yeah. the the topic then moved away from like this cool Nike advert or mannequins mm. to what is healthy and absolutely. And you know, I'm I recognise that I can't sit there and define that for anyone. There is so many different measures of health, and I think part of the problem was in that debate is you know it was obviously people on social media who were lashing out talking about it, but there were also people in our national newspapers writing about it. You know, supposedly qualified journalists. But when you look at that, you think, okay, that's your opinion on it, but you're not a doctor or a medical professional or a nutritionist. Um, So who are you to judge whether that is healthy or not? I think, again, we look at health quite simplistically in that when it's something we can see, we feel more comfortable to judge it. But we know with health, obviously we've spoken about mental health before in particular, and that's an area of interest for me, that isn't something you can see or judge. So we have a very different view of that. And health, you know, there are so many different things to take into view there rather than just body fat, which is what we tend to focus on because it's something we can see and something that feels tangible to us. True. But, you know, there are all different things going on from mental health, obviously, even looking at, you know, there's so many different things within that cardiovascular health, there's dental health, there's so many different elements that we just never really think of. And there isn't the same stigma attached to um, in the same way that there is, I think, when we look at body fat as a whole. No, that's so true. It's, it yeah. could be one marker of health, of course, but it yeah. is certainly by no means the only one. And we know there are lots of women who will be a size 18 who do exercise and will probably have better cardiovascular health than somebody who might be a size 8 but never exercises. No, 100%. I went to my CrossFit gym, I think it was like a couple of years ago, and I walked in and there was a, people of all different body shapes. Mm. And, you know, I, and I had this in my mind. And I looked at one of the guys and he was really, really big. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, okay, you know, you can't be too fit. That was the first thought that went my mind. And mm. then the, the guy was an animal. Really? His cardio was just insane. He was super strong. Yeah. I mean, you never know. You know, you look Absolutely. at um, Serena Williams. Yeah. You know, her body brilliant. type's big. She's... I'm one of the you know the best, best female, female athletes, tennis yeah, player. We've seen. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you know you go out on London Marathon Day and see the same thing. There yeah, are lots true. of people yeah. whose BMI would be would be categorised as overweight or even obese, but you know they can run over 27 miles, which I think is pretty impressive. No, it's true. But there's still this thing around obesity and diabetes are the biggest costs to the yeah. NHS, and we do have a huge problem. Absolutely. And, and there's go on. Sorry. No, no. So mm-hmm. think it's thinking about how to encourage people mm. to to eat better to reduce their weight if it's a weight problem yeah and absolutely i mean that, that there's no denying that it's a problem and i think it's not being naive in saying it's not a problem and we shouldn't address it because of course it is it's a big burden on our, on our nhs and along with many other health issues i'm sure but it is something that of course needs to be addressed but we're not so great at preventative measures i think with our health care or the way we view health in our western world and i think we very much look at a plaster solution afterwards and you know people get obese for a variety of different reasons which perhaps we'll talk about but we then kind of look at them point the finger and go well you're obese you're costing our healthcare system money and you need to lose weight but we know that way of 
attacking the problem doesn't help. It actually often makes it worse. So there's a really interesting study that looked at um, kind of weight uh, weight loss promoting campaigns versus kind of weight neutral campaigns around health, and they exposed them to people of kind of in different weight categories. What would be like a weight neutral? Um, so something that doesn't so when we think about health you know we want to try and promote people moving their bodies more intuitive eating things like that rather than going you know you're overweight you need to lose weight it's dangerous you're you know it leads to cancer things like that which i'm sure will come on to and so they found the results from the study that actually the campaigns that focused and promoted weight loss specifically were either ineffective or had a detrimental effect to people's weight when they followed it over a period of time and you can you can imagine the same thing if someone kind of points their finger at you and calls you a name it doesn't really encourage you to change or to try and live a healthier lifestyle no but you've got so you've got there's there's a few different areas. I think like we can talk about the kids and education and stuff, mm-hmm. which is I think like the root, like the, the really thing you need to tackle. But then people who are currently overweight and obese, we need to think about how to how they can start re-engineering their diets and their lives to start to become healthy. Yeah, it's absolutely. a big. I mean, I can I can imagine it's like a massive, massive hurdle to get it's over mentally hard. just to and we're asking them to do that in an environment that doesn't really support that way of living and we, we're often asking them to rely on kind of willpower alone to do that you know you walk into any shop now and you're surrounded by foods that are laden with sugar or saturated fat or things that we're supposedly not supposed to eat and it's very difficult to resist that we weren't designed as humans to live in this culture of abundance of having so much of everything all of the time available to us we were you know we evolved to be hunter gatherers to hunt for our food and to not have it so readily available and that's causing problems but i actually think we need to go way back beyond you know, not to say there's, of course, that these people can't lose weight and become healthier, but actually it's looking at going back to what's causing that. And I think that's, again, where we tend to look at very plaster solutions or surface solutions when actually looking at the root cause of the problem. And we know through various very long, long-scale studies now that people who've experienced childhood trauma or neglect are much more likely to become obese in later life than those who haven't. So there are emotional reasons around why people are becoming obese. It isn't because they're lazy or lack willpower, which is often the perception, I think, of our society and which is so damaging and what causes that stigma. So it can't be a coincidence that if you experience trauma, actually it changes the wiring of your brain um, experiencing trauma particularly in early life so between the ages of one to four where your brain is developing if you experience neglect or trauma in any way or what they call ace adverse childhood experiences your likelihood of um, becoming obese in adult life and also experiencing mental health illnesses um, jumps up significantly interesting but then also we have these bad choices you can make because back in the day when we were hunter gatherers mm. if you had that that mental illness or or traumatic experience when you were younger, you wouldn't have had the opportunity to go and eat. Of course, like yeah. processed carbs and sugars. But we know that's something that doesn't look to be changing anytime <laughs> no. soon. But I remember at school. I mean, I luckily I played a I played a lot of sport, mm-hmm. but the but the food choices were awful. Like I, it yeah. used to be pizza, burgers, chips. Absolutely. I never got any education on what healthy eating is. Yeah, like, that's ever. important too. I think that that's been lacking in our education system yeah, generally. And yeah. you know, we went through the kind of fast food culture, the microwave ready meals. When I was growing up, ready meals were quite trendy because it yeah. meant you had a microwave, yeah. which meant you were more affluent. So that's true. we didn't have the same level of awareness. And I think it's improving, but I think it just will take a lot more than just education around what healthy eating is or means for people. Yeah, but also you find that um, lower socioeconomic areas uh, tend to eat worse. Yes, absolutely. And also the food's cheaper. Yes, It's absolutely. not as healthy. I mean, healthy eating is quite expensive. It can be really expensive. It's not accessible to everyone. And no, again, no. I think that's something to recognise in that struggling financially. If you do what is easiest and what is cheapest and what is accessible to you, it's not yeah. always, you know, not everyone can unfortunately shop in Whole Foods or Planet no. Organic. And that's, again, something to recognise. But then, you know, there's a loads of, I mean, I, we live in London. Um, mm-hmm. There's loads of like, you know, the little fruit and veg shops along the street where... Yeah. You know, it's like a pound for a bag of 
fresh vegetables or fruit so you can you can do it oh totally of course i think yeah absolutely it's it's a choice that people still make at yeah, the end yeah. of the day but i think the the reason why those choices are made are complex and definitely yeah not yeah. something that i think is that easily fixed and certainly not a, we're not able to fix it by the kind of campaigns that we're seeing now with cancer research yeah UK, oh, let's talk about been, that yeah yeah highly criticized so what so what well. was the campaign so the campaign was about obesity and it basically there's they launched a campaign to say obesity is also a cause of cancer um but it's in a style of a kind of cigarette packet to say you know we've obviously focused for so long at how smoking can cause cancer or many cancers but you know did you know that also obesity causes cancer and there has been a big uproar against that as people feel it is fat shaming it's it does the opposite of what it's intended to do and again that study i referenced there have been other similar ones to show that actually that kind of advertising or health promotion doesn't work um so why are we still doing it and we need to actually and again particularly when we know there is a very significant link between trauma and as a child and obesity i think it's actually just quite cruel to be pointing the finger in that way and I think it puts all the emphasis on the individual of saying you know you're obese you need to lose weight because you could get cancer it doesn't look at the system as a whole that I think is broken yeah. and our society which is ultimately true. has an influence yeah but then but then are you saying that, that everyone who's obese has had some trauma no like, of course not of course like not this- everybody but it's very common. Yeah, it okay. is very yeah. common. And we know there's also a bi-directional link between depression and obesity as well. Yeah, so yeah. if you're depressed, you're more likely to become obese and vice versa. So there are lots of different things at play. And it's often a much deeper psychology than we ever acknowledge. And I think that's the problem. Yeah, Trauma yeah. is obviously, there is one significant link there that I do think needs to be recognised. But of course, that won't be the only problem or the only influence, I think, in that world. Yeah, because I guess the, the, the tobacco campaign worked because I think a lot less people are smoking that's true but I think for a long time smoking was very trendy wasn't it you know you see these kind of sleek women in the 50s adverts for holding a a cigarette yeah whereas I don't think we've ever felt that way about obesity no for us we've we have a very narrow view of what looks good particularly as a woman I think you know it's a very slim figure or a slim and curvy figure it it isn't what we think of as obesity as something that is desirable or we want to move towards it's true but I was you know I I mentioned actually I I whatsapp to the um picture of the Colombian mm. mannequins in yes. Colombia because my colleagues there at the moment it's um big boobs and a big bum yes and it's very, quite very curvy yeah really really curvy waist, yeah yeah and it's just quite interesting and, and also I think you know back in the day King Henry the eighth time it was really fashionable for women to be to be big that's true and in certain cultures I think it still is I remember yeah, once yeah. we had um a lovely guy who's from I can't remember where in Africa but he was a, a security guard in our building and I walked in after having a break over Easter and he yelled across the foyer oh Melissa you've put on weight but like <laughs> it was a really positive thing like it was a compliment <laughs> and I was like okay that was that's what you know 10 packs of mini eggs would do for you yeah. <laughs> but you know in their culture he didn't see that as a as an insult or something negative but he yeah. saw you know they often it's viewed as having abundance having wealth things like that and, yeah. and and they see it more as healthy than the opposite so definitely culturally it varies i i think that's, yeah, yeah it's that's, quite interesting yeah but just to because i mean i think we it's, it's agreed that we do have an obesity problem yes and it's just thinking about how to how to tackle it in the right way mm, which is totally. quite interesting and i think it has to be a very long-term strategy and i think that's something that, that tends to be lacking in our thinking overall with health as kind of how can we look at this over the next 50 years not just the next five to how can we really change it but another really interesting initiative I read about was in one of the Scandinavian countries they introduced an initiative where they had nurses call in on new mothers and periodically over the first couple of years of them raising their first child Um, and they measured the effects of this so it was a very long-term study as when the those children grew up and went on to find work or whatever that might be and they measured that the the families that had the visits from the nurses and um, their children were less likely to end up in prison and more likely to hold down long-term work than the families that didn't have the visits from a similar social economic background so it off you know it starts right at that early stage yeah, yeah. i think as well i think it's you know it's not just about educating it's often about support as well for 
new mothers who don't feel equipped to deal with that, single mothers as well who don't necessarily have the, the social support yeah. that they yeah. need. Yeah. I think it's going back that early and saying, what can we do at that stage to make sure that people you know, are well-educated around this kind of thing, but also have the right social support and not subject to abuse or neglect and you know, teach mothers how to parent in a way that you know it's not something we get taught and no. you know I can't say from a personal experience but I know many people have found it very challenging becoming a new mother and you know trying to do all the all of the right things but not knowing if you're getting it all right and particularly if your own upbringing wasn't great or your own model of parenting wasn't great that's obviously going to influence how you parent yourself true but I think it's just it's not just the mum I think it's like the whole whether family unit or friendship unit or social yes, absolutely. circle because you do find you know, let's say that um, and the parents could be healthy, the grandparents might not be. You go to your mm. friend's house, and I mean, for me, I think it's about it's about educating them at school because yeah, your parents that, could be unhealthy. Too. Yeah, but I mean, so my my kids' school, they they're, they're doing quite a lot on healthy eating, mm-hmm. um, and then so that the, the uh, school meals are like relatively healthy. Yeah, um, but they have like a different things on the menu: chicken, fish stuff like this, vegetables mm. um I, so i think if you do because that's you know, really important yeah. i think and that's yeah. something that's certainly been lacking for a long time in schools and i think yeah. that is so essential the the study i referenced was less i think it was less kind of healthy eating focus but more about this is how not to neglect your child this is how to create a bond with your child yeah. this is what your child yeah. needs at this stage of life and you know things that <coughs> might sound quite simple to us but i'm sure aren't and actually people need support on that and of course not just mothers also fathers too this yeah. particular study was done quite a while ago in order to follow those um, the families into the adult life and so it focused yeah. on mothers but now obviously father inclusive yeah. but it's just helping out people who perhaps didn't have the best start or parenting themselves helping them become more proficient parents so that abuse and neglect doesn't happen and better education overall better care for those definitely kids. The other thing is, so there's there's three kind of pillars to like good health. It's mm. like nutrition, exercise, and sleep. Mm. And we always forget about the sleep. Sleep's so important. Like a, just really quality sleep. Yeah, there's again a big link between uh, being underslept and being overweight, which yeah. is now because if you're tired, then you like maybe you'll snack more. Absolutely. You're, you know, you're when you're tired, you go into survival mode, which just means like you, you, your instincts, you know, your natural human instincts of going for food, your willpower's lower generally. Yeah. You feel more tired. So you're more likely to go for a kind of sugary snack to give you a short energy yeah, boost. Yeah. Yeah. Sleep's a big one. You need good solid sleep. They mm. say like eight hours, but also mm. it doesn't have to be in, in chunks. It went in one big chunk. So you could be in and get a little nap at lunchtime. Yeah, I've read that when they've studied like humans a long, long time ago, again, hunter-gatherer time, that we slept in two phases. Yeah. So we, we did have a, a, essentially an afternoon nap, which sounds great to me. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Not actually, always I've, accessible, but if you can, amazing. No, it's it's important. I'm actually doing a podcast with a guy called Nick Littlehales, who's a oh, sports yes. sleep coach. I know of him. Yeah. He wrote a great book about sleep. Yeah, to the R90 technique. So it's like 90-minute Phases, sleep cycle, right? yeah. yeah. So I can't, um, can't remember what the actual terminology is, but humans aren't born to sleep in one chunk. Mm. And uh, when you're a parent, everyone gets so caught up in they've got to sleep through the night. Yeah, and which you know, often doesn't happen, right? It doesn't happen, yeah. And then you, and then you rush to put them into their own room really quickly because mm-hmm. that's kind of what you do, certainly in like Western society. Yeah. And yeah, and then you get all these sleep problems, and then you get like, I mean, with bunny, like, but you have these all these bunnies and like cuddly toys. Yeah. And then the kids like just get addicted to like sucking their bunnies because the parents Comfort just. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's it's really interesting. But if you get all of that right, then mm. you you know the, the mental health issues I think are, are tackled. You feel more comfortable because kids just need good love, attention, care. Yeah, and absolutely. Have, right. uh, the only problem is if if you didn't have that in early life, you might need a stronger intervention to feel mentally and physically healthy yeah. as well. And that might mean talking therapy for some. It might mean yeah. medication for some. Um, but absolutely, I mean. If you can get those three things right, you're, you've got a pretty yeah, good chance of definitely. feeling in good health. So I think, it's, I mean, for me, like the schools are just vital in mm. doing that because if you're, you know, if your parents don't know anything any about anything about that stuff, you've got to get it from school. Yeah. But then you get into these things. So the the cancer research campaigns, because mm. the other thing is 
we do need to educate people. Yeah, we do. And Absolutely. maybe people don't know that obesity causes cancer. They don't necessarily link it in their mind. Maybe. And so, you know, I guess people take these adverts in, in different ways. And so I'm, I'm definitely for education. Yeah, so am I. I think you know, it's I just think it's being important careful to, how we do that and yeah, yeah. being mindful of the language that is used in particular. I think for most people, if they are overweight or obese, they will likely know that that's not great for their health, I'm sure, in a variety of different ways. I don't think it comes from ignorance, personally. And I might be wrong, and there might be some cases, of course, where that awareness isn't there. But I think the way in which we educate and communicate, and I think our health education in schools, like you said, needs to be much, much better. We learn about so many different things that we never go on to use in everyday life but actually looking after yourself and your health is so cru- crucial why is it not taught in schools yeah. in a more comprehensive way but yeah. also an inclusive way which is yeah. important no true but i just remember that going back to tobacco it started mm. out i think like a little softly softly tobacco mm. causes cancer suddenly then you have the photos of like, images yeah yeah of like a heart with the black and all the tar Absolutely, and everything yeah so no, I think that, it's that has you're right, and it has reduced smoking rates. Well, almost smoking, completely. Yeah, I mean, I, so I don't think my kids will smoke. It's not cool to smoke. No, anymore. It's, a, it's often seen as quite antisocial. In antisocial. Some ways. You even get people in the pubs. So on Saturday night, I overheard there was a table next to us smoking, mm-hmm. and the table behind them, on the at the top of their voices, were like, "Oh, I hate! Like this is disgusting. Yeah, how can people <laughs> smoke?" And it was like really shaming them. Yeah, I think that does happen a lot. And I think there's definitely, you know, from my perspective, definitely less people I know that smoke now than used to. So that is definitely reducing. And I'm sure, again, awareness around that has helped, of course. Yeah, people know yeah. it's... But, you know, there are also a lot of people still smoking despite knowing, yes, there are links to cancer, other illnesses as well, generally bad for your health. Yeah. But it's not always as easy as saying to someone, don't do that because it's bad for your health. Okay, yeah, I'll, um, I'll stop eating, I'll stop smoking. <laughs> no, Unfortunately, it's not always that straightforward. No, no, definitely, definitely. But then something needs to happen. So I think with the school stuff, that's that's yeah. important. I think the, the, the mass advertising, which I guess this is, is important. Maybe it's just thinking about how to do it in a... In the right way? In the right way, absolutely. And using language that doesn't feel it's kind of finger pointing at one demographic or group of individuals, um, which is going to make them feel more kind of shame or stigma around their current state, which they probably already feel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, And you can imagine probably already feel a bit outcast from society. So I think that just worsens that feeling and doesn't necessarily help find a solution yeah and maybe the government needs to do something because mm. i mean you know with with let's say the plastic bag stuff i mean the, the minute they started to charge for plastic bags they've yeah done, they've, i think they've done a sugar tax yes I mean, they have these... done a sugar tax absolutely yeah absolutely i think I mean, the it's... government you know we need to understand that ultimately all of this stems from people trying to sell us stuff yeah, you know, yeah. it's it's all of the advertising around it as well, which draws us in, and there is, I think, a lot of different things at play. But I think the government could be doing more, and yeah. I think particular, particularly looking at early interventions. Yeah, definitely. And the problem, you know, often comes down to resource and cash. But that study I mentioned with the the home visits for the yeah. first time mothers, they also tracked the the saving of that, and they looked at how much it costs to do that. But then what they saved through, obviously, people not being in prison and people contributing to the economy in a positive way it was quite a big saving overall but obviously you've got to have you've got to put the funds in up front yeah, which yeah. is what I think we struggle with no that's true we look at fixing rather than okay what can we do to prevent people getting to that stage yeah. in the first place that's no, true whoever whoever gets into power Boris or whoever oh, it might be <laughs> they need to yeah they need to put a long term yeah, I think so, because I think what we're currently doing clearly isn't working yeah. in many ways yeah. in that we know that obesity levels have gone up. So we know that the current way of trying to tackle that, of saying, look, obesity is bad for your health in all of these different ways, is clearly not working very well. So it's looking at, yeah, what else can we do there that's going to have a long term effect and trying to get a better understanding of the psychology behind it and the root causes, which yeah, I think yeah. is where any kind of intervention should start. True, true. But then these these last two things so the nike the nike mannequin Mm. and the cancer research campaign it feels like these are the two big things there haven't hasn't been much prior you see a lot of like it's all the social media like social media promotes super thin bodies really muscular yes no body fat like you know bursting with muscle Mm -hmm. um 
and then but apart from that I mean I, it feels like it's just now starting to kick off with these yeah there have been some campaigns I think that have been run both by the NHS and and we know also that lots of kind of health not just health food but when you think about companies even like Weight Watchers and yeah, Slimming World yeah. and all of the, these diets and based yeah. companies yeah. that again it's a big money making industry diet the whole diet industry Absolutely. Yeah. and that's very much been pushed for a long time you, there was the um, do you remember the Bikini Body Ready advert that oh, was yeah. in the tube that, that people also kicked off about that which I can't remember one or two years ago now yeah. people were saying well I am bikini body ready you know there was this idea that oh, yeah, again, yeah, there's, yeah, some, yeah, there's a way you have to look like that if you're going to wear a bikini yeah. otherwise it's not acceptable True. and yeah, I think I all of that side of things have been pushed for a while and I think diet culture has been very prevalent and a big part of I think again what shapes our view around what health is in that true. it has to come in a very slim package or That's true. with zero body fat which yeah. isn't realistic. I'd like to say move away from like diet to like mm. healthy exactly. lifestyle, healthy yeah. mind, healthy body. And again, I think the trend is going that way of looking at a kind of more holistic view of things, yeah. things like intuitive eating, of trying to listen to your body and what it needs and wants, rather than I'm on another diet, um, yeah. which I think again was quite fashionable in the 80s, you know, where, where I think when Weight Watchers came became quite big. And I think hopefully things are slowly moving away from that, but it's still a very big industry. You think yeah. of diets like the Atkins, the Duke and diet that all and have these celebrity endorsements which again um, imply that that's the way that we should be living. It's a minefield because yeah, if you google is. healthy eating there's so much stuff oh, that comes God, up. you'll be there all day. Yeah, it's very confusing and we get so many conflicting messages from yeah. the, you know not just the mainstream media now but things like social media so you've got all the health and fitness bloggers many of who aren't really qualified to be talking about nutrition but still offering advice on it um i think that makes it very confusing uh, for people in terms of what what actually is healthy eating anymore yeah true i try and use the kind of motto of if it if it has um, a label at the back of the pack it's probably not healthy <laughs> and you just want to go for like fresh stuff yeah. fresh vegetables fruit Absolutely. The closer Meat it looks fish. to something that grew out the ground or is yeah. natural, uh, yeah. then, yeah, absolutely. I try and live by that rule too, <laughs> mostly. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Great to speak to you on that. You too. Very interesting subjects. I'm sure we could talk for hours. No, but definitely. <laughs> definitely. Let's circle back um, and mm. see like how it's developed and what's been going absolutely. on. Absolutely. Yeah, that would be very interesting to see. Awesome. Well, thank, thank you, you for having me. Pleasure. See ya. Bye. Hey, folks. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe in all the usual places.